Good morning and welcome to North Church. Welcome to Church Online. We are so excited that you have decided to worship with us this morning. My name is Amy Moffitt. And I'm Pastor Sampson. And I want to say Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. It's a good day. It is a great day. We had an incredible time on Thursday evening. Lots of dads. They got to eat some barbecue. That's right. It was yummy barbecue. It smelled amazing. But you know what? We're going to keep celebrating today. We've got a professional photographer in the lobby for for dads to take pictures with their kids or families. We've got uh, breakfast burritos right now. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, you'll have to Uh head off the platform and go grab one. (laughs) And we're going to be doing corn dogs. We've got lawn games. It's going to be an incredible day. And we just want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. That's right. You know, Amy, since it's Father's Day, I thought there's no better way to start out the experience uh, than with a dad joke. Of course. Okay. So this is a really good one. All right. Let's hear it. All right. You guys ready? You guys ready? All right. So here it is. Where do you go to learn how to make a banana split? Where do you go to learn how to make a banana split? I'm not sure. You go to Sunday school. (laughs) Get it? (laughs) That's a good one. That is a good one. See, that one was genuinely funny, so... (laughs) Well, if you're in our lobby, I want to encourage you to come on into the auditorium because we're about to kick off our experience. That's right. Hey, I want to invite a friend on stage, uh, one of our Harper's House partners. Everybody, would you welcome Bill Snyder? Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. So, so happy to have you here with us this morning. You know, we love partnering with you, but I want you to have an opportunity to tell everybody about Compass Experience. Tell us what that is. Sure. We do an urban outreach to youth. Uh, We do financial literacy. We do leadership development because it's hard to lead unless you lead yourself. And we also do employment for kids in the urban core. We are in Kansas City and in Wichita. And starting next month, we will do our first site in Oklahoma City. We're excited to be here. We are so excited to have you you guys coming down. Well, I know that you and Pastor and Shannon have been in relationship for a long, long time. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you could have all kinds of stories. Absolutely. But what I want to know is what is your favorite thing about Pastor and Shannon? I think my favorite thing about them is their authenticity. Yeah. Thought about that for a while. There's uh, no play. There's no give. When it comes to integrity, they're first. They've been that way because I knew Rodney and Shannon before they were Rodney and That's Shannon. Right. They were just friends and they've always <laughs> had integrity and they've always been truth tellers. Love that about Come them. Come on. That That's awesome, awesome, Bill. Thank Thanks. you so Thank much you for joining us. We'll get to hear more from Bill a little bit later. Uh, and I also want to remind you, we'll have communion in the experience a little bit later. So if you're joining us at home, grab some bread, some juice, be ready for communion in the experience. That's right. Well, if this is your first time joining us, we would love to know that you are here. So if you'll take a minute and fill out our North Card. It's a little bit of information. It's at northcard.me. We're gonna send you a $10 Chick-fil-A gift card. If you're in the auditorium, I would encourage you to scan the QR code in front of you, or you can grab that North Card and take it back to our connections area. Now, our connections team is amazing. You do a great job. They can answer any question that you have about North Church, and they would love to get to meet you. So if you'll take that to them, they're gonna exchange it for a gift card as well. And for every North card that we receive, we get to bless the Compass experience. That's right. So every time you do that, we'll actually be making a donation on your behalf to the Compass experience. That's exactly yeah. right. So do you have any Father's Day plans today? You know, we're going to probably spend time with my dad. I think that's the plan. That's good. Uh, he normally does the cooking, he and my mom. So Man, I hope they cook something great for Father's Day. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. I know you're going to have a lot of fun with those boys. They're super special. Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. And it's a great experience here today, Amy, right? Like there's so many great things happening. And so you're going to want to definitely share this experience online. Absolutely. You know, if you go to Facebook and I'm going to encourage everyone in the room right now to go ahead and take out your phones. This isn't something we always encourage, (laughs) especially in student ministry. But right now we want you to take out your phones and go to Facebook and share the experience. You just click the share button and write a little post and everyone will know what's going on. Also, we love, our host team loves to engage with you. So if you're joining online, I want to encourage you to type in the chat and let them know where you're watching and who you're watching with. In the house, check in. This is another great tool. You can tag friends, you can check in, write a quote, take a picture, one of the pictures in the lobby. We would love to see it. Wherever you're watching, I want to encourage you to stand with us right now as we go into our worship experience. much for being here. We love you guys. Come on, let's worship. 
take communion this morning, great job. We take communion this morning. Sometimes we come into it and it's almost somber, like a funeral service. But I love they ended with celebration because we of all people on the earth, Christ died for our sins. He paid the price. But there's also the resurrection. Today we remember his sacrificial death on the cross his shed blood and his broken body that provide healing and provide redemption and freedom for us. The second thing I want to highlight, and sometimes we skip over. Could we read the passage? For I received from the Lord why I also delivered you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. We know that part very well. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. And it's not said a lot anymore, but Jesus is coming. He is coming. We always major on Christ's body, but I want to do something this morning. I want you to take just a second, and I want you to examine yourself, because the passage after this clearly tells us to examine ourselves, which means, how have you interpreted the body of Christ? How have you treated the church? Is there anything in you that you've mistreated the friends or the community of Christ or the world at large? God put a scope on us. God examine us and help us to know that we must not only treat the church well, but we must treat the world also well. Would you take take the wafer which represents the body of Christ? Thank you, Father. Take 
Take the juice that represents Christ's blood. You know what I love about communion? The first communion was done around a table with the body of Christ. I love communion when we do it together. Thank you, Father, for today. Because today is your day. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not promised, but we have this moment with you. And in this moment, we say thank you for dying for us. Thank you for being the perfect sacrifice that God sent that we could live in freedom. Today, Lord, if we've misinterpreted the body of Christ, if we've done wrong, Lord, right now we ask you, Lord, to forgive us and may your shed blood provide forgiveness. May the rest of this service, we honor you with worship and hearing your word and may we leave here differently than we came. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hi, Dad. I just wanted to say I'm so thankful to be your daughter. Thank you for all the ways you've helped me grow and the example of love and leadership and dedication that you've given me. And thanks for being my biggest fan and always showing up for me. I love you so much, Dad. Thank you for having such a huge impact on my life. You've taught me what it is to be a man, and thank you for teaching me discipline, drive, and to walk through life with open hands. I love you, and happy Father's Day. Hey, Dad. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you've sacrificed for me and my brother and and for our family. We love you so much. We're so grateful for you. Thank you, Dad. Love you. Hi, Daddy. I just want to say thank you for being a godly example of a father who loves and leads his family well. You'll forever be my hero. I love you.
Happy Father's Day. I don't know about you fathers, but for me as a father, sometimes I feel so inadequate. I feel so inept. Is anybody, whether it be as a father or as a husband, I guess those two roles are the highest calling that I have outside of being a follower of Jesus. But yet it's, too, that I feel so in need. But you know what? We have a heavenly Father that will supply everything that we need according to his riches and glory. And when you fail, we know that he hasn't failed us. And we can go to him. And if you didn't have the Father that you desperately wanted and needed, let me just tell you something. You do have a heavenly Father that has always been there. No matter what you've been through, he has never left your side. He is there for you. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 28, as we continue this series called Deuteronomy? What a great day this is. I am thrilled to have with me today on this stage in Oklahoma City and also in Guthrie, Bill and Wendy Snyder. And uh, Bill was with us here in Oklahoma City. Wendy is in Guthrie. And they're with the Compass Experience out of Kansas City, which they're soon to have the Compass Experience here in Oklahoma City. You'll hear more about that a little bit later. But we date back all the way to the 1980s. And they were mentors to Shannon and I. They were college pastors on the campus at Oklahoma State University. And <clears throat> Bill and Wendy and Guthrie, Shannon, I love you very much. And thank you for the years of input into our lives and being there for us. We thank you so very much. Would you give a welcome right now to Bill and Wendy Snyder? <clears throat> also want to just remember today. In just a few weeks, we're going to celebrate Independence Day, the 4th of July. It's when we in America declare our freedom um, from England and that we're going to be a free people to worship as we want. But the truth of the matter is not all Americans were free at that time. Uh, it would be nearly 100 years later before there would be the Emancipation Proclamation. And then it would be almost three years after that before there would be June the 19th, 1865. We know it as Juneteenth. It's also known as Freedom Day. There's several other names that come with that Emancipation Day. There was a proclamation three years before, but that was the day for the freedoms of black Americans. And I just don't want us to forget who we are as a country and that it is our freedom to worship um, that makes us unique from most nations around this world. And may all people stop right now and celebrate the freedom we have mainly in Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Would you do it? Deuteronomy chapter 28 says, if you fully obey the Lord your God, 
and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but you will, they will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fight, fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless you all the work you do. You will lend to many nations, but you will never need to borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail and will always be on top and never at the bottom. You will not turn away from, you must turn away from any of the commands. You must not turn away from any of the commands I am giving you today, nor follow other gods and worship them. Someone say amen to the reading of God's word. Father God, we thank you, and may God, these words come alive to us right now. Build us up in our most holy faith to chase the vision that you've laid out for us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Last week, I'm kind of intimidated right now to follow Shannon's preaching. Wasn't that so good? So good. So good. It's, it was two years since she had preached before, and I'm telling you, I am working hard to get her back on the schedule. Well, some of you need to help chime in and make sure this happens, okay? We haven't got her scheduled yet, but we're trying to. But as she was preaching last weekend for the first experience here in Oklahoma City on that Sunday, uh, my grandchildren were watching from Tulsa, and before they went to their church at City Church that morning at the 8.30 experience. And as they were watching, Gideon is the only time he's really watched Shannon on TV or whatever is because of FaceTime, right? And so he kept yelling at the TV. He said, look at me, Gigi. Look in my eyes, Gigi. <laughs> and as I was thinking about what he said, it just resonated with me what Deuteronomy is all about. Moses is once again sitting with the children of Israel, the second generation. And he's revisiting what he gave to the first generation that they failed to follow through on in hopes that this new generation will carry them into the promised land. And what he is ultimately saying throughout the book of Deuteronomy is look at God. In other words, God is saying to them, look to me, not to the world, not to the other nations, not to other gods. Look to me, says the Lord. And he lays out there that the Lord alone is God. You find it throughout the book of Deuteronomy. He would say words like, listen to me. Again and again, listen to me. He would say, learn from me. He would say, love me alone with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and live for me. And if you live for me, you will live like nobody else because of the blessings of God that will be upon your life. Is anyone tracking with me today? 
And so you have this beautiful message here in chapter number 28 that's speaking of what is waiting for them. Uh, this past couple of weeks, Charles Northcraft, who is a, just an expert carpenter in our church, came and spoke. He's also a minister of the gospel, too, been a part of our church for a number of years. And he came and spoke to our chapel, which happens every Tuesday morning at 8.30, and anyone is welcome to join us. But he, he spoke to us, and it, it was a great message. And basically, he talked about what he does in his role of remodeling. He does remodel of businesses and homes, and he will come in. And when he comes in to see their situation, he will listen to them, but then he will begin to paint a picture of a preferred future of what could and should be if they just simply listen to him. He'll paint this vision, but then after he paints the vision, because everybody likes the vision, then he dives into the nitty gritty, which is the teardown process. Because he lays it out there to them that this is not going to be easy and that there's going to be a process to this, and he talks about the teardown. And then he talks about how the rebuild will happen to eventually get to the end product, which is the vision that he started off with. And what you have in this passage is that Moses is given the vision from God. And I want you to listen today as I break down those three segments based upon what Charles Northcraft gave to us because they are crucial if we are going to move from where we are to where we should be in Jesus Christ. So first off is the vision. The vision of a preferred future of what could and should be if we just simply follow after Jesus. You see, in this passage, the vision is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is awesome. It is something that everybody would say yes and amen to. But for that vision to be achieved, it would require wholehearted commitment. And Shannon laid it out there so well last week. Deuteronomy chapter number 11, he revisits again what it looks like to have a wholehearted commitment. He says, so, so commit yourselves wholeheartedly to the wor these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. It's interesting because almost exactly, Shannon read last week the same words, but it was from a different chapter, chapter number six. Why is that? Because again and again throughout Deuteronomy, he's revisiting the cost of wholehearted commitment and that you got to take this with you every where you go. You don't segment off God for Sunday morning when you come to worship Jesus for an hour and a half. You carry with him when you're driving down the road. You go with him when you go to bed at night, when you get up in the morning, when you sit down to eat, when you're at work, when you're at the mall, when you're on vacation, wherever you go, God is with you or should be with you. You see, there is a vision that you have for your life. All of us have one. And then there's the vision that God has for your life. The question is, do those visions align? Are they congruent? And the objective is not to convince God to go with your vision. The objective is to follow in line with God's vision for your life. Because we have mission drift. And even when we have those Sundays or that moment where we just give everything to God, we got to every day give everything to God because we have mission drift. There was only one person that never had mission drift. There was only one person that did everything that God wanted him and just aligned himself perfectly to the vision every single day of his life. And his name is Jesus. At 12 years age, he laid it out there for us. <laughs> Can you imagine his parents come into Jerusalem? They travel several days. They get there. They're with their whole family, probably maybe 100 people that they're with. They worship, and they bring their sacrifices, their yearly sacrifices unto God, and then they begin on the journey back. In some way, Jesus didn't get counted in the number, and they're traveling as a large group. They get to where they're going to bed down for the night. They look around, can't find Jesus. One day's gone. They sleep the night. They go back the next day, 
And by the third day, they find Jesus. And where did they find Jesus? They found Jesus in church with the people of God and with the word of God. And when his parents said, where have you been? He said, did you not know I must be about my father's business? In fact, Jesus lays out how we are to protect the vision right there. It is in the house of God, with the people of God, and with the word of God. And when you surround yourself with those three elements, you can guard yourself from missional drift that all of us have a habit of doing. My, my dad, and a shout out to him, dad wasn't a perfect dad. None of them are. But my dad gave an incredible example that I just... I want to live up to what it means to serve God. I, I remember as an eighth grader, him pulling us out of sports, summer activities anyway, and, and I went to work. I, I didn't get to be a part of playing summer baseball like everybody else did. From then on, I just worked all summer, long hours. We put in the hours managing 3,000 acres of land. But there was one thing my dad did not compromise on. Is that when the house of God was open, we were in the house of God. We were there Sunday morning. We were there Sunday night. We were there Wednesday night. If we were in revival, which happened quite often when I was a kid, we were there Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. We'd work right up to time to go home, shower real quick, get food, get right to church. Because my dad valued the house of God, the word of God, and the people of God. There was one time that he would let me off for the summer. That one week that we looked forward to, and that was youth camp. He wanted to make sure we were at youth camp because he knew that there would be the presence of God and other, other young people that were loving God and God would do a work in my life because he valued those things because he wanted me to have the vision that was in line with the vision of God for my life. And then there's the teardown. <sighs> the teardown is what all of us dread. I, I was this past week talking to Alba uh, Alba and Carlos came here three years ago from, uh, a little over three years ago from the Dominican Republic. They had never been in a cold environment before. And they moved here from 90 plus degree temperatures with great humidity in the middle of, or the first of February into sub freezing temperatures. They did not dress appropriately. They did not have what they need. They were moving with just what they could put in bags to check on a plane. They come here. And I remember a few days later going over to the place where they were staying and going into their house. And I walked into their house. I just, I, it just took my breath away. I was like, it is so stinking hot in here. And it was cold outside, but I mean, it was extra hot in there. And after they turned their, I kind of walked down the hallway and looked at the thermostat. It was set on 78 degrees. Now, in our house, we don't do that. When we I like it a little cooler, and also an electric bill. I mean, we keep it like 69 degrees. They got it 78 degrees. They ain't acclimated yet. I was talking to her this week and found out that they keep their temperature on 69 degrees now. And when they go to bed at night in the winter, they turn it down to 65 degrees. You know what they've done? They've acclimated. Here was the problem with the children of Israel in this story. They had been 400 years in slavery in Egypt, and they had acclimated to the way of living in Egypt. And so when things got hard out in the desert, they began to say, let's go back to Egypt. You see, the problem was God got them out of Egypt, but now God needed to get Egypt out of them. And sometimes it's easy for us, we give our heart to Jesus, but then there's still a process that God wants to get the world out of us. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, but then the transformation of the mind happens. In Romans it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the teardown I'm talking about. And that's hard work. It's surrender. It's dying to yourself. When I do a leadership thing, oftentimes I will make this statement that leaders see what others don't and have the courage to do what others won't. And when it comes to the tear down in our life of the things that need to be broken away from, sometimes we just don't see it. 
And there's people in this room right now that you just don't see the tear down that God wants to do in your life. And I pray that before you leave today, that you see clearly what God wants to break you free from, the strongholds of this world. Some see what they need to do, but are comfortable remaining where they are. And if that's you, I pray that God makes you so uncomfortable and miserable where you are that you don't want to stay in your situation. You say, oh, pastor, that doesn't sound too sweet and loving. That don't sound like God. Oh, no, it's all God. Because my God does not want you to remain where you are. And he will do whatever he needs to do to get you to move from where you are to where he wants you to be in him. And then there's those that you see the need and you know you need to change, but you're not willing to pay the price. I pray for a Holy Ghost conviction that will come upon you, that will just grab hold of you, that you say, I am tired of where I've been living and where I'm at, and I'm going to change and pay the price. I, when Shannon and I was li living in another place where we're living right now, she wanted to do this remodel. And this remodel was going to take walls coming out. It was going to take tearing up concrete, and that gets real messy. Talking about doing some plumbing work in the, in the kitchen area. It was going to be a six to nine month process in living in hell. <laughs> At least that's the way I saw it. She wanted to do it and I'm like, please let me build a place. Please let me build a place. She finally gave into it. I did not want to live in a dusty mess for almost nine months with something that was going to cost about half of what it was going to cost to build me a new home. I finally convinced her. But let me just tell you, when it comes to the rebuild in your life, you've been only given one temple. It's not like you can move to another body. You've got that one temple, but you've got to pay the price. Time and time again, Jesus said, you've got to count the cost. If you're going to go to war, you've got to count the cost. If you're going to build a city, you've got to count the cost. What is he saying? If you want to change, you've got to count the cost and surrender completely to God's process in your life. If you're going to reach that vision, there has to be a tear down in your life. And then finally, <laughs> there is the rebuild. The rebuild. And Shannon dove into it last week because the foundation to the rebuild is the Shema. That word Shema is um, equivalent to the New Testament Lord's Prayer. And most of you, if you've been around church, you know what the Lord's Prayer is. And so in the Old Testament, that's what they had, the Shema which is found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter six. Shannon covered it last week, verse four and five. And the Israeli people, everywhere they went, would quote this again and again. And I'm just gonna give you two verses of it. They would pick more from the book of Numbers. But it says here in verse number four of chapter six, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord alone. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And everything would hinge on that. And in the New Testament, when Jesus was asked about the greatest of commandments, 613 of them in the Old Testament, the scribes, the Pharisees were sitting around listening to what he would pick. And he reached down into the book of Deuteronomy and pulls out and he said, it's this. You are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And notice how Jesus added to that. Now I know that it says in the New Testament and the Old Testament that you are not to add or to take from the word of God. But when you are the word of God and you're the one that wrote it, you could add or take from it anytime you want. Somebody listening to me. And he adds the word mind there, which is so crucial. And he's saying, you've got to love. And he said, the second is likened to it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, this is the foundation of everything. If you're going to rebuild what needs to be rebuilt in your life, the Shema, 
love the Lord your God and love your neighbors yourself is the foundation for all of that. But we got to understand that sometimes I have people say, well, I don't know, God said, can't enemy, love me, love me. No, no, you got to understand that we cannot love God until he has first loved us. And in 1 John, it says it this way. It says that we love because he first loved us. The only reason that we can love God is because he first loved us. The only reason we can love our fellow man is because he first loved us. He has loved us. And so that's the foundation. And out of this foundation comes three things that I want you to write down in your notes. Because I know all of you are note takers. And if you're not a note taker, start taking notes. Number one is this. Their identity in God had to be reestablished. For the people of Israel, their identity in God had to be reestablished, and the same goes for every single person in this room right now. Two weeks ago, Pastor Hetty from Guthrie spoke to our chapel, and he told some stories, and every time he tells stories about his past life, I sit there in awe because it does not look like his present life. He talks about gang fights that he was in. He talks about stealing. He talks about stuff that I'm thinking, that does not, how he beat people up? Hetty? Some of the things that he would do. But then there was this transformation. Because if any man be in Christ, they are a new creation. You see, what Hetty didn't realize is that he was created for another purpose. When he was living his old life, his BC life, he didn't understand his identity in Christ Jesus. But when he had this transformation and became a new creation, he understood his identity in Christ Jesus. And there was a radical change of life. But he pointed out there that it doesn't change because some of us, we have this radical conversion and then we stop growing in God. And that's not how it should be because he pointed out every day when you engage the word of God, every day when you absorb the scripture, every day when you talk about it, it begins to change you. And he began to ask us, what Are you changing? Because when you are reading the living word of God, something in your life should be changing and becoming more like Jesus Christ. Because we're, we have a new identity in him. You see this Deuteronomy chapter number 12, it says, do not fall into the trap of following their customs and worshiping their gods. It's so easy to just follow the seen instead of the unseen. You see, the struggle with identifying with God is that I don't get to do what other people do. I do what God wants me to do. Which brings me to the second thought. Their responsibility for God's purpose had to be grasped. Your identity in God has to be realized. And then your responsibility for God's purpose must be grasped. Whenever we built the home, I was the general contractor of the home that we're living in right now. We wanted to build a pool. We built a pool. I did not know even some of the regulations that was required, and one of those is that you must have a fence around the pool. And as I got into that, then I've realized you have to have certain gated fences. And these gates have to be child-proof, so they have to have a thing on top that you raise up, and it's the only way you can get in to that gate. My initial response to that is that this is crazy. But there is a reason why those rules and regulations have been put in place. It's because some kid walked into a neighbor's yard that couldn't swim, fell into a pool, and drowned. And so even though it's not my child or so much, I still have a responsibility for other people. Do you realize as a follower of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility for other people? Our example, the way we live, and even our reach must show the heart of God toward other people. And as I read this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it kind of fit in line with today's Regulations. Look at it. It says, when you build a new house, you must build a railing around the edge of its flat roof. That way you will not be considered guilty of murder if someone falls from the roof. Isn't that interesting? 
This was not Edmonites setting or Guthrie people or Oklahoma City people establishing these rules and regulations. This is 4,000 years ago and Moses, through the help of God, establishing some rules and regulations and stipulations for the people of God, saying we've got a responsibility for others. You see, being created in the image of God comes with responsibility. And what he wanted them to know, and if you go back and look, chapters number 12 through chapters about number 27, it's kind of boring because there's a list of rules and regulations, but they were applicable for the day and for the hour that the people were living in. You see, my God does not write anything in his book without reason and purpose. He has purpose for everything. And his purpose for each one of us is to be responsible with our lives to help bring other people to the saving knowledge of God. We have a responsibility with how we treat people. This past weekend, we had somebody come in to talk to our staff. His name is Preston Williams. He attends our Guthrie location. And he talked about how that his journey of not living for God, and now he's on fire for God. He's a rapper, and he travels and just... His, his rap music is so articulate, so beautiful. The words are just so biblical and so powerful. But he told some of his story before he did the raps. And he talked about how that soon after he had gotten saved, that there was a foreman that worked, he worked under, that was a, quote, pastor. But yet this foreman who was a said pastor, did not show an example of Christ at work. And the devil began to work on him. And then he also had a landlord who was a pastor who did not do what he said he was going to do. Even though that monthly rent was paid every month, it wasn't doing what they... And he began to have a little bit of angst against them, but then he began to realize that while they say something and live another way, that his God is who he's gonna honor and look to. And he began to realize that, but he, as he was saying those words, I began to weep and I began to cry because I began to say, I don't wanna be that pastor. I don't wanna be that pastor that somebody looks and says, oh, he preaches one thing, but he lives another thing. But let me just say, this does not apply for just the pastors. It applies to anybody in this room that claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're exempt from this. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we should be responsible for how we live and how we act because what we do should be backing up what we say. We should be saying, follow me as I follow Christ Jesus. Which brings me to the last thought. Their belief that the promised reward will come. Their belief that the promised reward would come. You see, when your identity is established in God, and when you're responsible for the purposes of God, there will be a belief inside of you that realizes that what God says will come true. In chapter 28, was what God said would happen. And you begin to realize this, if I walk out what God wants me to do, that that vision will come to pass. You see, how we behave is a reflection of what we believe. Terry Alford is a man in our church. He's had some hard times. He didn't have a father that was there for him. There was a lot of excuses he could have had, but he had an encounter with God, the Father, and it turned his life around. His belief system that changed his behavior, and now he's walking in the promises of God. Would you watch this? First time seeing my dad, I was 15 years old. It's a little awkward in the beginning. 
I, I really didn't have a relationship with him. You know, I would address him as Pops. That's just something that I said. That's like saying, sir, a guy, or dude. Hey, Pops. Hey, Pops. Hey, Pops. I still long for more of a relationship that I did not have. Uh, I was 17 years old when I had my, my first child. Not understanding, you know, relationships. I had a son, you know, in high school. So, and I had a desire for more, as well as that, that, that emptiness that I had with my father not being in my life. When I met my college sweetheart, Kathy, on campus, uh, she was involved in Christian organizations on campus, and she did total the opposite of what I did running with the wolves. That's when I recommitted my life back to Christ. And that was the beginning of, of our marriage because I wanted to do it right. And I had to let Kathy know, I have a son. When Kathy and I first got married, we attended marriage conferences. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go to a marriage conference so people will think we have problems. Hey, we were, we were in love and we were gonna figure this out together. One of the things that, that, that I experienced or that I thought was wonderful, that they have uh, sessions. And what they do is they'll uh, pose a question and then the husband and wives will separate. One will go back to the cabin and then the other ones, all the men will stay in the main room. The question was, what is the purpose of life to you? And, you know, I started to write to this question, the purpose of life, and I started off by saying, well, my purpose is to work, provide for my family, to protect them, and uh, to take care of my kids and to love them so they'll know who their dad is. Something came over me where This is, this is kind of a tender spot. So something came over me where I was lying to myself, just going through the motions. So I prayed, I prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to speak to me because I really wanted to know what is my purpose? I'm married, I'm happy. And I think it was the hurt from my father not being there. So deep down inside, I was 30 years old, married for five years, and I had an emptiness in my heart. I was questioning, I don't know what it is to be a man or a father. I have no idea. In a fraction of a second, my heart was filled. And I literally, I sat there and I wrote and I wrote and I turned and I wrote. And they actually said, men, time's up. And you can hear other men at the conference, weeping for whatever reason. And I was one of them. And it was so powerful because I just, I felt like I finally understood the love of Christ. Because as I prayed, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're a man because you're pursuing God, you're pursuing me, the Father. And I went back to the cabin. When I went in the room, I tried to be as cool as I could be. And as I started to share with her, 
She's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Why are you, why are you crying? Why are you crying? <laughs> I said, I'm crying because I'm happy. I'm happy. I, I get it. I understand. I understand the love that God has for me. And for 30 years, I've been holding out and waiting for my dad to tell me that he loves me. But I realize the love that God has for me. Reflecting back and having that child for the first time within my marriage, and then Taryn starting to walk and starting to talk and coming home and to hear your child for the first time say, Daddy. That was a word that I never used growing up. And that's a part of the healing also, the love that you get from your children, even the brokenness where you came from. Those are my tears of being sad. That's just, anytime I take, I, I talk about that, it's just, man, I'm just, I'm just so happy. Just to understand that, just to understand that. That's why relationships are so important to me. That's why when you see me talking to the guys and just, you know, a dad or a young man, hey, yeah, <laughs> give me a hug, brother, you know? And don't be afraid to tell another guy you love him because you never know his story and, and his hurt and his pain, you know, and wanting to feel complete, you know, from knowing that he's loved from another guy and not understanding the love of Christ. Thank you, Terry Alford, for sharing that story. I want every man standing. If you're 10 years of age and you're in the room, you're a male, stand to your feet. Calling out the manhood in all of us. If anything speaks to manhood, it's responsibility. Responsibility to live your life the way God would want you to live your life. That's what manhood is about. But the devil will lie to us. You know, he mentioned... I was believing a lie. He was lying to himself. We start lying to ourselves when we listen to the lies of the enemy versus the truth of God's word. I want you to just simply think about this a moment and repeat this after me. Say, Lord God, I want my identity to be in your son, Jesus. Not in anything else. I assume my responsibility as a child of God to do the purposes you have for my life. And I believe that the reward is coming. The promise that you have for me is mine in Jesus' name. Amen. I want the rest of you to stand with these men. Our prayer team is coming and making themselves available. Listen to me. Look at me. Don't, don't, don't lose this moment right now in this frame. The devil is lying. Specifically, I feel in my heart that the devil is lying to people, and some of you believe lies. Some of you have felt like maybe that you're broken as a mother or you're broken as a father and you can't be that, or maybe you did not get that from your father. Father, there's some wounds that still need to be healed. I want you to step out from where you are and come for prayer. Maybe it's something else you want to pray for. It's open. But I specifically feel today that there's individuals, that there's wounds, there's hurts, there's pains, there's maybe your personal failures, that you feel like, I can't do this. Yes, you can through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ. If you need healing, whatever it is, our prayer team is available and open. 
come and receive prayer in Guthrie and Oklahoma City. Father God, may your Holy Spirit do the work of healing right now, of restoring. And for anyone that's far from you, I pray, God, that they'll come running to you, running to you, and follow what you have exampled in water baptism as that outward sign of the inward work of Christ Jesus' work in their life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Prayer is open. Come, receive prayer right now. You can do anything. You can do anything. My eyes will see your glory. My eyes will see your glory. You can do anything. You can do anything. My eyes will see your glory. morning it has been. Happy Father's Day. You know, uh, if you're here and uh, man, that word hit home to you as it did to me, uh, you know that God is calling you to a deep relationship with you, uh, that he is our father. Uh, and maybe you're here and uh, you felt that tug on your heart, whether you've been a believer for all your life or maybe just recently you gave your heart to Jesus. Your next step is water baptism. And we want to help you take that step. And so if you can, grab a North card, fill that out. Stop by the Connections area. Let us know. And we want to help you take that step. Isn't that right, Amy? That's exactly right. We love seeing life change around North Church. And we get to see that because of your faithfulness and giving. If you are part of our family, I want to say thank you. And I want to let you know there's a way, multiple ways that you can give. And those are all available on the screen. Again, thank you for helping life change happen around here. If you're here today and you're a guest, we would love you to go to our connection area. Fill out a North Church card. We'll send you a Chick-fil-A and also... The Compass Experience gets an advantage in every card you fill out, we get a donation. Thank you for being with us today. That's right. What a great way to do that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? All through the month of June, we're celebrating summer fun. And let me tell you, uh, every Thursday night, we've been doing family dinner, Chick-fil-A here, okay? And so 
If you're planning on going out of town for vacation, this is a great way to come and experience church. A lot of folks don't realize we have church on Thursday, Bill. Did you know that? Yeah, I was here. We okay. have church no, on Thursday, <laughs> okay? And so this is a great way for you to come and be a part of the experience even before you go out away, away for a weekend. That's right. It is super fun in the month of June. Well, we have volunteers around here, and we cannot do what we do without them. We call them our heroes. Today, we want to celebrate our hero of the week. It is Chad Huffmeyer. He's an incredible dad and volunteers with our North Kids. So thank you, Chad. That's right. And hey, you know, uh, Bill, it's been such a pleasure to have you and Wendy and uh, Lord and just to celebrate with you all the things that's happening Compass Community come to Oklahoma City and you know what we decided as a church uh, not only do we want to support Compass Experience as our Harford's house partner but we want to do a special gift today so today to Compass Experience to Bill and Wendy Snyder we'd like to give a gift of ten thousand dollars we'll take it thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so much Thanks, guys. Thank you. We, uh, some, sometimes when you uh, have relationship with people, there's some people that are just for a few years, and there's some people for a lifetime. And Rodney and Shannon have been lifetime friends. When we started this urban outreach, and I walked away from pulpit ministry, everybody thought, what are you doing? The greatest satisfaction of our life is taking these urban kids and teaching them leadership. We partner with Bank of Oklahoma and they teach financial literacy in our cities. And we also get them jobs and employment and teach them to be powerhouses, ethical powerhouses in the marketplace. We do everything, I'm glad you said what you said this morning. We do everything under a 10-2 umbrella. Jesus gave us the two commandments. Moses gave us the 10, but Jesus gave us the two. Everything we do is loving God with all our heart, loving our neighbor as ourself. Thank you for your support. Thank you for loving what we do. Thank you. Wow, what a way to end the day, okay? Thank you guys. Hey, if you can, help us pick up some trash so we can get ready for the next experience we'll start, start, start shortly. Amy, would you lead us in saying the vision? I would love to. It's on the screen. Will you join me? Love God. God, Love love people. people, Follow follow Jesus. Jesus. Happy Father's Day. Thank you.